Thank you so much for joining me today, President Olian. It's so nice to have you back. I know it's been a little while. I'm thrilled. Thank you, Vanessa. And I always love having the opportunity to speak to our students. Yes, of course. Um, so we have a range of topics for you today, anything from construction on campus to a reflection of your time here. I know you started in July of 2018, um, so it's been almost five years here. Um, so we're really excited to have you. Thank you again. Um, getting started right away, um, most recently you sent an email out to the Quinnipiac students in the community about the devastation from the earthquakes in Syria and Turkey. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the things that the Quinnipiac community is doing to send out their help? Well, first of all, my heart goes out on this unimaginable tragedy to all of the people that are directly affected and all of the families that are indirectly affected, whether they're there in, in Tokyo or Syria or here. And we do have students and faculty who are from Turkey. Our uh, dean of the School of Inge uh, Computing and Engineering is, is Turkish. And everyone um, who's, who's Turkish, whether they're there or here, has ties. And I, I just cannot imagine the sense of loss and heartbreak that is going on with lost lives and missing uh, lives and, and just the hardships that these families are going through in the face of just the, the terrible personal tragedies, but also dealing with all of the contextual challenges. I mean, it's freezing. Um, there is not enough help. Um, they've been totally dislocated in terms of their lives basic things like a roof over your head and food I mean it, it's unimaginable so anything we can do in our community um, through the various help organizations that have mobilized and you want to go through those organizations because they're organized to provide help where it's needed they have the supply chains to bring um, support over there so that's what we're providing and of course any counseling resources that our students need in dealing with the heartbreak and the tragedy and the sense of loss, uh, we're here for our students and faculty and staff. Uh, but my, I mean, you know, life can change in a second and it did for tens of thousands of lives there in, in areas that were already suffering. Yeah, I know that there's also, you're holding a group support session later today in about an hour or so. Um, do you believe that there is a large portion of our student population um, that might be affected that will be in attendance and interested in that? I don't know. I mean, and sometimes it's not just those that are directly affected, but those who feel empathy and support and sadness from something like that, or it could trigger a p sense of personal loss that is related to something else in a person's life. We encourage everybody who wants to draw on support or provide support to attend the session. Great. Well, thank you. I know that there's definitely been some efforts across even New Haven. I've been seeing certain mosques are raising money, donations. So it's definitely been a conversation within um, you know, the last couple of days or so. Yeah, I mean, the magnitude of devastation is just unfathomable. So anything we can do spiritually and tangibly is going to be, I think, helpful. Definitely. Um, so moving on to our next topic, I would like to talk about the construction with you. Um, so we know that the South Quad uh, project, the reconstruction, um, is a $293 million project. Um, could you break down for us where the money is coming from for this? So first of all, I think this is going to be one of those milestone events in the history of Quinnipiac. We haven't had a standalone building that has been built since I think the early 90s. Um, we just completed this fantastic recreation and, and wellness center. I hope everyone's using it. I hear that it's pretty crowded. I see that it's pretty crowded. Um, but standalone buildings haven't been built for a long time. And, and when, when we think about buildings, we don't think about them as bricks and mortar, walls and roofs. We think about them as enablers. What is it that our students, faculty, and staff are going to be able to do through the buildings that they couldn't otherwise do? 
whether it's learning in environments that enable immersive learning, whether it's uh, community related events like an auditorium or meeting rooms, whether it's classrooms that enable certain kinds of discussions that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do, technologies that are preparing you for the workplace, research facilities, labs that you can do some cutting edge research whether as a faculty member or a student who's doing it side by side. So these buildings really provide for learning, development, community uh, in ways that we don't currently have. We're on an accelerated schedule. Uh, everything is going to be done barring something unanticipated in the calendar year of 24-25 at different points. We have three buildings that are going to be built. The business school building, the um, academic and lab building that will also include a 700 person auditorium and a residential building that will have 417 uh, new beds and all of them reflect this intersection of living, learning and research that we're trying to achieve through des the design of the building. So it's not about great looking facilities, which they will be, it's about what they enable. And you asked Vanessa about how um, we're going to fund it. First of all, through our endowment. Secondly, through philanthropy. And third, through lending against the residential uh, fil building, which has its own revenue stream. Okay, thank you. Um, now, how do you plan to maintain a positive relationship with um, some town residents amid, I know some of them might not have agreed with it or opposed it? Well, first of all, our town relationships are very important to us and I'm gratified to see um, a lot of support from the Hamden Mayor, the Hamden uh, Town Planner, the Hamden Chief Engineer. I, I, I mean, it's it's really been a wonderful partnership and they've spoken uh, very um, unequivocally in favor of the developments at Quinnipiac for which we're very grateful. Um, our town and, uh, and gown relationships happen on a lot of different fronts. Uh, our students are incredibly important there. I mean obviously how our students live and conduct themselves with our neighbors is very important and I'm proud to say that our students are very responsible. Uh, every year we go first and foremost to our students when they come in and say, look, you have a responsibility as, as mature neighbors to the town. You represent Quinnipiac. You be a good neighbor. We also provide a hotline to all of the neighbors in case there's anything. And I have to say the incidents are very few and far between and we take them uh, very seriously. We also have many, many outreach efforts to the town through our students, faculty and staff in helping where help is needed, whether it's in some nursing homes with expertise, whether it's through the big event when we go and volunteer to paint or weed or do whatever is needed in uh, community uh, facilities. We have our student athletes out there organized for um, a whole lot of outreach efforts to the high schoolers, kids and coaches that could use the expertise of our student athletes. Uh, we have um, a community partnerships with the O'Keefe Center uh, through food banks, through the food that we might not use and we leave um, for the residents. Our VP for Strategy and Community Relations and Chief of Staff Bethany Zemba spends a lot of her uh, time and most of her waking hours, frankly, on finding ways in which we can be uh, a very positive neighbor and a source of advantage and pride to all of the community because it is really, really important to us. And in terms of the South Quad, there was a very extensive and comprehensive process of hearings, of taking the design to the town, 
having comments, the Planning and Zoning Board, and I'm proud to say that the Planning and Zoning Board fully supported the developments here and will continue to dialogue with the town and with the Planning and Zoning Board um, throughout any process of development. And, and let's be clear, when we thrive, the town thrives because we're the biggest employer other than the, the government um, here in town. And all of the projects that we undertake have a heavy reliance on providers in the town, whether they're plumbers or electricians or the roof layers or all of the infrastructure. And on top of that, all of the businesses in town really enjoy the relationships that they have with our students, faculty and staff and the parents who come in and the visitors. We are an economic driver of the success of Quinnipiac. And I think the town really appreciates that, comes to realize it. And, and we have to respect um, the needs of the town. And sometimes we modify things, but we always try to do um, projects and partnerships in the most responsible way. I will add that all of our buildings are sustainable. Um, the Recreation and Wellness Center is LEED certified and I think that um, all of the other buildings will be uh, LEED certified in a certain way. So we're, we're, we're being very conscious of our sustainability commitments. Thank you. And that also leads me to my next question um, relating to student accessibility on campus. There have been some concerns with how the university plans to deal with that in the future. Um, do you have any? Well, uh, I, I want every student to fully thrive at the university in all aspects of their lives. And uh, whether it's exploring your own leadership in clubs, whether you're looking for various forms of self-actualization, no matter who you are, to, to be the best you can be, including students with different abilities. Um, I, I recognize that these buildings create disruption while they're being built. Uh, and we are doing our utmost to make sure that everyone can reach the buildings when they need to reach them. We have transportation organized for students with um, different abilities. Uh, and I, I, I mean, anyone who needs extra assistance should use our accessibility resources and we'll accommodate them. Our hope is that we don't wait two years, but as soon as is possible to create pathways through the project that are safe, and that's the emphasis, that are safe, we will create them to provide the shortcuts and the direct access that our student needs. But the key is to make sure that while the construction is ongoing, to provide for number one, accessibility, and number two, safety for everyone. And as, as we've said, as Sal Filarity, our VP, and Tom Ellett said, we need a bit of patience because this is a big project got to take a breath. It'll be fantastic, just like the Recreation and Wellness Center it looks like it's been here forever. It belongs. It's so gorgeous. This will be the same way. Um, the outcome will be fantastic for the institution. We'll get there, and we want to minimize any form of disruption to all of our students, including those who have special accommodation needs. So please, anyone, let us know if there are issues and we will accommodate you. Thank you. And then in terms of once those buildings are built and the construction is over, um, has the university thought about keeping the environment inclusive for students who might have disabilities or accessibility issues? Um, 100%. Uh, that is a priority for us. We have um, added actually uh, student advisors for our uh, students who need special accommodations. We, as part of our uh, DEI survey, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion survey, one of the things came out that came out was a need to provide added resources for students who need accommodations. Uh, one of the things we're doing is creating subgroups that can focus on the particular needs 
of different populations, including LGBTQIA plus students, veterans, students who need accommodations, students of color. Those particular groups are going to be um, focusing on helping us discover more ways in which we can accommodate um, any special needs that exist on campus. Because no matter who you are, no matter what your differences are, um, you, we, w we want you to thrive. I will do a plug for Ability Media, um, which is Dave Stevens' group in the yes. School of Communications, as I'm sure you know, Vanessa. They were all out at the Super Bowl filming uh, pre-Super Bowl activities and, and, and you know, interesting documentary pieces. Um, so we, we want to find particular opportunities also for those uh, with, with different abilities to exercise their uniqueness and their unique abilities in whatever field they are. So we're very fortunate that Dave is part of the School of Communications and has really brought in such mindfulness around um, students with disabilities and individuals. Definitely. Um, you mentioned DEI also, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that um, in that department. Um, the, res the university recently announced the departure of two members, um, Dennis Quartang and Donald Sawyer. Um, Quartang's departure would be the third in the last four years from the Title IX quarter position, coordinator position. Um, what do you believe has prompted instability within that department or position? So I wouldn't call it instability. Um, there are a few things that I would say about movement of people. Um, first of all, you're a Gen Xer, I think, Vanessa. I think the average tenure of a, on a job of a Gen Xer is two years. Not that I'm encouraging that, but people tend to um, thrive and then earn the right to leave. And so that sometimes happens. And Dennis, both Dennis and uh, Don are leaving for opportunities that are expansions of, of what they have here. I mean, for, for Dennis, I think he's, he's moved to Florida with his family and that just happened to, uh, to work. With Don, he's uh, been at Quinnipiac and really thrived and grown at Quinnipiac over 11 years. Um, and he sees a new opportunity there that really speaks to him after having done tremendous work here um, over the 11 years and, and really um, had an impact in the culture of inclusivity and the awareness of inclusivity. We have the 10-point action plan that we jointly developed, the LBGTQ priorities, uh, and Don has been key in um, achieving the outcomes that we've achieved. Don will be here through June, so we're going to be friends forever, I hope. And um, he, he, he's a person who looks to continue to have impact in different ways. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted and grateful that Professor Kalila uh, Brown Dean has agreed to um, chair the search which will be a national search for a DEI head and uh, we expect to get somebody who's going to be extremely qualified and continue the journey that I think has been very impactful towards building on the culture of inclusivity and continuing the um, the internal commitment to that all across the university and and remember, it, it, it starts with the leadership team, but it does not end with the leadership team. And the leadership team is forever committed to this, starting with, with me. But we all have to add to our focus on inclusivity across the institution, because it's each of us that creates a welcoming environment, that promotes um, a culture of inclusivity for each person that we deal with that then um, expands throughout the community. Yeah, and you mentioned these are definitely large shoes to fill um, and that it would be a national search. Um, what type of leaders are you looking for to come in for this position? 
for these two? Well, we're replacing right now mm -hmm. the um, the Title IX mm -hmm. coordinator and, and um, the interim is Sarah Hellier, yes. and she's uh, continuing the good work. Well, for, for the Title IX position, we need somebody who's experienced, knowledgeable, and thoughtful and sensitive about um, enforcing and uh, Title IX and making sure that our community is aware of the opportunities around reporting any incidents that th there's a concern about. In terms of the B VP for Equity and Inclusion, um, we have very clear goals as an institution. We want somebody to lead uh, as part of the management team, and this is a position reporting directly to me uh, because it's a, a major priority for, for me personally, but it's also one of our four pillars of the strategic plan when we talk about inclusive excellence. This is how we measure our success as an institution. And so the, the roadmap is pretty clear around our 10-point plan, around the DEI uh, climate survey results, around our LGBTQIA commitments, making sure that all of our differences are embraced, are celebrated, celebrated, make us stronger, and frankly, take us to new places that um, represent uh, incredible improvements in how we build a culture that is uh, truly inclusive. Yes, and you mentioned the Inclusive Excellence Survey, or the DEI survey. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, in the most recent one, um, some uh, percentage, 40, over 45 percent of the students said that the campus was not diverse. Um, and then in the 10-point plan to advance racial justice and LGBTQ plus plan, um, how can we plan to foster diversity on campus going forward? Uh, so I think it's actually, you said the most recent survey, yes. I think it's the first survey that we've ever done yes. of that kind. and. It, it, it's really helping us establish a baseline from which we want to uh, improve and have guidance around where we want to improve. I don't think there's any single initiative that will make us a more inclusive or diverse campus. It is all the little acts of kindness, of generosity, of pipeline development, of mindfulness around these issues, of embrace of people who are maybe coming from a different place in life and trying to listen to them and understand them. I mean, I can go through a lot of initiatives from start to finish. We're reaching out to high schools now that we didn't use to reach out to, to counselors in more diverse areas to try to create more robust pipelines. We have bridge programs to make sure that individuals entering the institution understand how to enter successfully, have a cohort of support, and then also have support from the rest of the institution so that their success when they hear their attention is augmented because of these support services. We have a variety of um, seminars around crossing boundaries, about thinking through differences, about being able to hear others who don't necessarily think like us, but we want to hear them and perhaps understand where they're coming from and maybe change our minds. Um, we have a variety of academic resources that provide support. For example, um, the two most important factors in retention on campus are whether you feel welcome and whether you have the financial resources to continue to um, attend. Well, um, there are a lot of points of connection that we seek, events, um, cohorts, clubs, that especially our CXO, Dr. Tom Ellett, is fostering for that sense of welcome. And all of the financial support that we strive to provide is to enable students to have those financial resources that they need. 
And oftentimes it particularly affects students who come from first generation families or from marginalized communities. And, and what we are trying to do is address sequentially the challenges that they might have um, to, to enable them to feel welcome and to thrive and to be able to s sustain their uh, time at the university. So th there, there isn't any single answer, but what we try to do is look at all of the resources um, that are available in support from before you even start till when you graduate and become an alum. And I should mention that one of the follow-up items after the DEI survey is um, a DEI audit in every unit to see what are we doing well and what are we not doing so well so that we can go and, and, and burrow down into the, the weeds, frankly, so that we don't just talk in generalities but actually fix it at the local level so, so that diversity is something that, and inclusivity is something that is part and, part to, part and parcel to every piece of our culture. Yes, I'd like to talk about um, the CXO position as well, Tom Ellett. Um, so you mentioned he helps a little bit in the DEI department. Um, I know that he helps students in a bunch of variety of different topics and um, departments, and his position is relatively new. Um, could you talk a little bit about what the reason was for bringing a chief experience officer to Quinnipiac? Yeah, well, thank you, Vanessa. Um, he, he affects all students. And uh, that's his role to be ultra student facing. I mean, all of us hopefully affect all students because that's why we're here. Um, his, his role was pretty new. I mean, I didn't know when, when I came on board and a few of us discussed it and, and created it, it, I didn't know of another chief experience officer in higher ed. I knew of them in the corporate world but not in higher ed. And when, when I came, there, there was this position that was provost and executive vice president, or executive vice president and provost. And that included everything. And that included everything academic and academically facing and curricula, and it included all of the student service, services. And when, when I looked at it, it just seemed totally overwhelming on both sides that you couldn't do justice on the academic side or on the student facing side that gave you enough bandwidth to be able to attend to everything and I think we were prescient in in seeing this because had this split not existed during COVID I don't think we could have done frankly, as, as well as we did. And so the provost has a huge span of control and deals with everything academic, all of the academic support services, the centers, etc. And then under uh, Tom Ellett, Dr. Tom Ellett, we have, and that's uh, Provost Leibowitz, Dr. Leibowitz, mm -hmm. and then under Dr. Ellett, we have all of the student facing functions other than academic. So it's one stop, it's dining, it's residential life, it's admissions and enrollment, it's financial aid, it's public safety. And this has also enabled us to create one stop because now what I, what I was hoping and I think it's happened I believe it's happened is that we don't go through this experience like you do when you go to get your license um, renewed where you go into one line and then you have to go to another line and start again and start again and start again and all you're doing is getting your license here what we're trying to do is create more of a seamless connection to the student so that you can do this and this and this and this at one stop now there are some things that you can't do if you have to delve into some deeper financial aid issues, um, but y you know you can solve parking and dining and initial bursar issues all in one stop, and and it is designed around um, the the student. 
And I, I do believe that all of the activities that are occurring on campus for students, uh, both as services but also after hours, uh, all of the extracurricular activities, um, are because we have somebody focused um, directly on this and singularly on this, and Tom breathes and lives um, students. I mean, he lives in, in the campus uh, housing and he has events, I don't know about every night, but a lot of nights at, at his apartment. And he's on campus involved with so many student activities and clubs. And I think it benefits everyone individually that participates in them, but it benefits the students as a whole, whether it's the dining advisory group or the parking advisory group. Um, or with SGA or some of the other advisory groups, parents' advisory group. So this way, he has the bandwidth to be in touch with all of these important constituencies and issues. Yes, um, so you seem to, you were talking a little about the success that it's brought to the university. Um, so does this mean that it's a position that you think will stay regardless? Certainly for the foreseeable future, I, I, uh, I, I think that it's, it's really, helping the focus of both sides. It also has enabled Dr. Leibowitz to focus on all of the academics, on the curricula, on the student academic support. Um, she, of course, interfaces very closely with Dr. Ellett and vice versa. They work very seamlessly. But I think this has given each of these functions an opportunity to really um, do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. That's why we feel that students are going to be really well served living on campus for three years because there's so much extracurricular development where you develop as a whole person um, and we embrace you as a whole person and you grow as a whole person because of the richness of all of these opportunities. Definitely. Um, I agree with that, and I've been um, in definitely in close contact with Tom throughout my years at Quinnipiac. Um, gotten to know and, each and other. And what have you done? Um, we in freshman year, um, he gathered together a freshman advisory board. Right. Um, so I think I was just walking along the street, and we saw each other, and he's like, "Oh, do you want to join my advisory board?" So I joined, um, and I was able to just be a little bit a part of the conversation that um, Quinnipiac was having. So um, definitely was nice as a freshman to have that. And he still has the freshman advisory group. Yes, yes, I think because there's a new that. freshman class every year. Yes, yes. I think we call it first year. Yes, and um, now there's ones for the second years and That's right. I think those are third yes. years too. And, and he's constantly getting great input and ideas um, from these groups, and, and whenever we can, we act on those ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about the 10-year master plan also. I know that you've been mentioning a little bit in each of the answers. Um, so I'm just curious to know um, how the idea for it came about and even how the South Quad construction project um, is leading towards the main goal at the end of these 10 years. Yeah. I don't know if the 10-year plan ever really finishes because at some point we'll renew the master plan. It's the master plan of taking the whole view of the three campuses and saying what belongs where. And if we have a view of the functions needed, the, the student services needed, the programs needed, and then the spaces that follow them, we'll be able to say, OK, if we're going to build new buildings, they need to be here to protect the aesthetics of the campuses, and that's really, I'm sure, um, whenever I talk to people, they're just overwhelmed with the beauty of the campus. Um, and so it's to protect the beauty of the campus while having a long-term view of what pieces need to be where. Because the last thing you want to do is build something here, and then three, five, seven years later, you really don't need it there or it's actually obstructing what you need there and you have to take it down or replace it. So if you have that long-term view, you can do things once with a mindset that addresses the functionality needs and preserves the aesthetics. And that's why we did it. 
And, and you know, when you talk about a 10-year plan, I mean, 10 years is eternity. So th will there be some slight adjustments at the margin? Of course. But we at least know, for example, the South Quad relative to the Quad, what, how it fits aesthetically, and that's going to be preserved as the main axis of this campus. And then we know what might be changed in the buildings that we are vacating, for example, the, the business school or the, um, uh, or the academic lab spaces from North Haven that we have there. So you have to have a view when you're building facilities that for 30 or 40 years of how this is going to play out and the domino effects. And that's what the master plan does. Yes. And you mentioned that there might be some possibility of change throughout the 10 years. Um, has it deviated in any way since it was first announced yet? No, not yet. Um, we, we, we have plans on continuing. I, I mean, the facilities are probably the place that you can do 10 years plans because it takes time to build. Um, it takes time to raise money to build. And so facilities, you have to have a long-term view. But I think that the, the basic contours of the plan are going to stick because we're also very conscious of maintaining the aesthetics of the campus. If you could describe the, I know that you were saying there, it might be renewed at the end of this 10 years, but for these upcoming 10 years, if you could describe um, the main goal in a few words for the plan and what the idea well, is. Well, the South Quad is the biggest development. We will be renewing some residence halls on a continuing basis. Um, when we vacate a couple of the, uh, the buildings, for example, the business school, we have a long-term view of what we might um, place in, in those buildings. Um, then the question will be what happens with some of the lab buildings that are on campus or um, in North Haven, and that's something that is mentioned in the uh, in the facilities plan and, and we'll be looking at once we have these new labs, we have the auditorium, we see how we're using the auditorium relative to some other spaces. So you, you, you have to um, look at the, thi at the, at the plan as a, as a, a, in its totality mm -hmm. and, and of course we are continuing to constantly renew spaces like the residence halls, like some parts of North Haven uh, and even uh, up in York Hill, which is some of the newest spaces that we have. Yes, I'm on York Hill now. So oh, good. Like Do you enjoy it? Yes, yeah, it's nice. Um, I like the On the Rocks part too. I'm <laughs> glad we are finally able to use it. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, a reflection of your time here at Quinnipiac now. Um, so you've been here for almost five years. Um, what is something that you are most proud of that you've done here? First, yes, this is um, four and a half, more than four and a half. It's, it's been fabulous. It's been an interesting time, I would say. I don't think anyone, just like you, Vanessa, you didn't expect to come and, and the world to kind of close itself down for a while. Um, y y you know, that was one of the most challenging pieces of, of, of being here, the most challenging, and that is to keep our student lives and faculty and staff lives protected, ongoing, to, to continue the mission of what it is we do within the severe constraints of what was imposed because of COVID. Um, and I, um, I, I'm proud of the way w we navigated through that while keeping our eye on the future. So you, you, you had this constancy of, of the here and now with, with COVID, but at the same time, we did not take our eye off the long-term bull. We made a commitment to build the Recreation and Wellness Center during COVID. Uh, because that was something that we thought would affect every one of our students' lives. There is a tomorrow. We're living it today. And uh, we had to continue. We already nurtured the plans for the South Quad then. We had a continuous um, commitment to curriculum renewal and programs 
uh, in support of our students that, that were constantly being expanded. I'm very proud of the fact that we have become a more diverse community, especially among our staff and in our leadership team. The, the talent that we hire is enduring and one of the most important pieces of what will last here. Um, and I'm really excited about the transformation into our future. And it is, it's, it's not about buildings, it's about what buildings enable. I mean, buildings enable our students to be as successful as they are in the marketplace because they're having these immersive and, and very relevant learning opportunities. The programs that we're building are very much about the future, where the puck is headed, um, an analogy that we like here. Uh, and by the way, our team, our men's team is number one, our women's team number six this week. Uh, go Bobcats! Uh, and I, I, I think that we're just continuing to position Quinnipiac as one of those incredibly nimble, agile, forward-facing universities of the future. And I believe we're executing on that with speed, with boldness, with rigor, um, with imagination. And I will say we're building on this history. I, I, I only landed here in 2018, as you said. This, this is a history of, uh, of a culture that has always been bold and nimble and agile and forward-facing. And, and we're just taking it to the next phase of this great journey. And I believe we're positioned incredibly well and excitedly for the future. Thank you. Um, so as you know, the last time that we student media was able to sit down and do an interview like this with you, uh, there were, we were masked. Um, it was in the middle of COVID. We, everything was a little bit crazy. So looking back on that now that we've come out of that time, is there anything that you think that you wish you would have done differently in the university? During COVID? Yes. COVID, um, you know, imposed a lot of challenges on, on people. I mean, whether it was our students who had to pivot very quickly in the way they lived and learned, whether it was our faculty who had to pivot very quickly on the way they taught, and um, on, you know, our staff who were often here through thick and thin, um, just taking care of everyone. I don't think we could have controlled this, but you always wished you had longer runway to prepare. We were actually very early in thinking about COVID and then in, in taking steps uh, to engage. But you always wish that you had longer runway. That wasn't our choice uh, to, to help people because it put a lot of stresses on people to, and all of the above groups to have to pivot and change. But all in all, I, I hope that we provided the support and uh, the understanding for the challenges that everyone went through and, and we managed to get through it together in a community that really was there for each other. And as the president of this university, what do you believe is the biggest value that Quinnipiac students, Quinnipiac community, sorry, holds? I think this is a very caring, student-centered, nimble, agile, future-oriented community. So we care deeply about the students and we prepare them in ways that are um, pretty much best in class for where they're headed. I, I feel that this is a community that embraces others, including faculty and staff of each other and of the students. So I feel a warmth here that is very special very unusual and emotional connection that people that I have for for our people, and I think people have for each other. There's an emotional connectedness, an emotional warmth here that's very special, and because of that, um, people are making a difference, going out of their way to really make things happen for our students and to care for each other. Thank you so much. Um, it was great to have you here for, on behalf of all student media. Um, we are really excited to be able to do this again. It's been a little while. Is there anything else that you would like to add based well, on? Well, just please invite me back whenever you <laughs> want to talk to me. And I appreciate it, Vanessa, and I wish you um, a lot of success. Congratulations you. on your Channel 8 
assignment and to everyone here at Q30 and the Chronicle. Um, best wishes. I hope you're having a fantastic experience. Thank you so much. Um, it's great you. to have you again. Thank you. Thank you.